Thank you. Mr Stephen Kerr. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I uh, have a pleasure to follow the Honourable Gentleman in his speech and to be part of this debate, which is, by any definition, historic. I rise to speak in support of the withdrawal agreement and the political declaration because my fundamental political belief is in pragmatism. I am no ideologue or absolutist, and I believe the success of the Conservative and Unionist Party has been its willingness to adapt to present realities and to work on a practical basis to deliver what is in the national interest. And it is in the national interest for us to leave the European Union in an orderly way by agreement. And it is in the national interest for us to continue to have close and cooperative relationships with our European neighbours. It is in the national interest that we achieve a free trade arrangement whereby we can continue to trade freely across borders without the encumbrance of barriers, tariffs and burdensome charges. And it is in the best interest of our economy, for businesses and for jobs, that this Parliament now comes to grip with the practicalities of our predicament. It is in the interests of our democracy and public confidence in Parliament that this House delivers on the instruction of the British people that we should leave the European Union. And the people's vote of June 2016 answered the question asked of the people by this House. And now this House must honour that answer. We must be careful that our opposition to this agreement is not simply about waiting for the perfect deal. What we have on the table before us is not a perfect deal. It is not an entirely comfortable deal. But in my judgment, it is acceptable. Compared with the risk of leaving the European Union in a disorderly way without an agreement, this agreement is a good agreement. It secures the rights of citizens, provides for a transition period, provides for an orderly departure from the European Union. I would much prefer that there was no backstop, but I accept that the commitments that we have given to the people of Northern Ireland, which we must honour, make a backstop of some form or another an inevitable element of any agreement of any description. I thank the honourable member for giving way, and I respect him as he knows that. But he talks about the backstop on Northern Ireland, and he said he will support this agreement. Does he understand the difficulty that we have with the backstop and the serious repercussions it will have for the future of Northern Ireland and the United Kingdom? I am grateful to the Honourable Gentleman for his intervention in that respect that he described I reciprocate to him, and indeed to all of his colleagues who are recognised as unionists. I do understand the complexities and a lot of the emotion as well around the issue of Northern Ireland's place in the United Kingdom. But I have thought long and hard about Northern Ireland as well as Scotland, and I believe that the backstop doesn't have to and mustn't represent a threat to the integrity of the United Kingdom, and that we must work together, those of us who want to honour the, the decision of the people in June 26, and we must work together to make Brexit happen. Otherwise, we will have a crisis of political confidence in this country. And there are so many people, sadly, on both sides of this House, who do not want to honour the result that the people gave us in June 2016. And the alternatives on offer are this agreement, or no Brexit, or a hard no-deal Brexit. I will come back to those points, but I am grateful for his intervention. Negotiations, I would say, Mr Speaker, are about achieving the acceptable, but very rarely about achieving the perfect. The withdrawal agreement is a predictable compromise, but a compromise that is bearable for both sides, and crucially, it delivers on the referendum result. Since shortly after being elected to this House, I have had the opportunity to serve on the Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy Select Committee. The conclusion of the latest report of the Select Committee, which was a report based on revisiting evidence we had received 12 months earlier from 
Businesses that operate in strategically critical sectors for the UK economy – automotive, aerospace, pharmaceutical and food and drink. We're collecting, we were collecting evidence to their, their, their response to the withdrawal agreement. And what we found was, and it's clearly in the conclusion of the report, that while they would prefer to have stuck with the status quo, they now needed clarity and certainty, and for that reason, their consistent message to us as a select committee and to this House through our report is to support the withdrawal agreement. They were also incredibly respectful of our democracy, and they accepted the result of the June 2016 referendum, something that so many people in this House seem unprepared to do. These business leaders were prepared to accept that result. And they were actively seeking to apply a pragmatic approach to what is undoubtedly a complex set of problems. It is now for us, as parliamentarians, to be pragmatic and deliver the certainty that businesses need. And we do that, Mr Speaker, by supporting the withdrawal agreement. I am a unionist. It is core to who I am, and I have an unshakable belief in our country and its peoples, in Scotland and in the United Kingdom, which stands as the most successful political union in the history of the world. Now, my warning to colleagues is simply this, that nationalism is waiting in the wings. The withdrawal agreement, in my judgment, is no threat to the Union, but no deal is. The threat in Scotland is from the Scottish nationalists. They want the disruption that no deal would bring, because their nationalism is more important to them than any other issue. They make no secret, their leader makes no secret, that their single unifying purpose is to break up the United Kingdom, and that transcends every other single issue economic or social. They want chaos. They want the disruption because they believe it will give them the platform to launch their bid, much talked about among the, their ranks, for a second independence referendum to break up the United Kingdom. And I would say to those on my side of the House in particular who advocate no deal, to me, as a Scottish unionist, they exhibit some of the same symptoms as the SNP. Like the SNP, they would appear to be prepared to sacrifice jobs and prosperity if it meant they could realise their version of our future. And so, yes, I will happily give way. Thank him for Gavin Reid. In terms of nationalism, I will just remind them who gave EU citizens the vote. Um, in the 2014 referendum, who's gave the EU citizens vote and franchise, and who hasn't? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'm not sure what the intervention amounted to, but I'm grateful that the honourable gentleman has his opportunity to make it. So I would appeal uh, to my colleagues on this side of the house, in particular, not to sacrifice the good for the sake of an unri unrealisable perfect, Mr. Speaker. A second referendum a no-deal Brexit or a general election all point to more uncertainty, and I cannot support any of those outcomes. We must remember that we voted as one United Kingdom to leave the EU. My constituents in Stirling are weary of Brexit and the shenanigans that go on in this House. They want us to move on. They want us to turn the page. They want us to deal with the pressing issues that impact on their lives, every single one of them, and the life chances of their families, irrespective of who they are or their story. We need to deliver stability and certainty. We need to turn the page, and voting for this agreement is the best way to do it, and I commend it to the House. Thank you. Mr Gavin Robinson.